up gamers? I'm Jason. I'm Julie. And today on Dice and Dragons, we are going back to a world that we've enjoyed, a legacy version of a world we've enjoyed. This is Aeon Zen, Legacy of Gravehold, published by Indie Boards and Cards, designed by Sidney Engelstein, Nick Riley, and Kevin Little. Now I'm gonna to toss it over to Julie, who will tell you more about the game itself. So it is a, uh, I almost said competitive, it is a cooperative game for ages 14 and above, plays one to four players, it says in about 60 minutes, uh, that really depends on the name list that you're playing, your skill level, how many mages you're playing, uh, and it does not include the setup time in between the different missions. Yes. But about 60 minutes is about right. There's a lot to do as it's a legacy game, which we'll talk about more in the review. And what do you think of the age range, Julie? I think that's about right. I mean, you might get away with a 13 year old and you might be able to play with a younger player with some assistance on one of the easier mages, but uh, yeah, it's not the it's not the easiest game. There's some combos that need to be pulled off and things like that to be able to get this game really rolling. Well, if you want to survive, that is. Otherwise, you can just play it straightforward and you will die a horrible, horrible death. Now, what will you be doing in Aeon's End Legacy of Gravehold? Well, you're going to be marking up some cards. You're going to be stickering some mages, stickering some breaches and stickering some cards, which we don't have in front of us now, as you upgrade your mages and cards in your fight against the Nameless. You're also gonna be picking one of the two narrative tracks to start out. You can either join the side of Greyfold, which is the side you've been on since the start of Aeon's End. Uh, later on, the more recent games, New Age and Outcast introduced the village of Azur, some of the people that survived on the surface instead of underground like the original city of Greyfold. So pick your path, you're gonna get different mages, but don't worry, at some point you'll be able to experience all of the content. So it's not like you're only gonna be playing half a game and miss out on a whole bunch of it depending on the storyline that you pick. Now, we're not gonna be showcasing the components, we're gonna be going right into our review. So if you'd like to see an example as to what you're gonna be getting in this big box, take a look at our unboxing, the cards popping up right now, so you can check that out and then come back to see our review. Now, for those of you who are interested in this game, it's gonna be your first experience to Aeon's End. I'm going to give you a primer as to what you'll be doing in the game. Otherwise, feel free to go down below in the video description, hit the timestamp and jump ahead to our review. So in this game, you're going to be taking on the Nameless and fighting off their Nemesis deck with your own player deck. To do that, you're going to be acquiring cards and placing them into your deck. And you start by placing them to your discard pile, which is very standard for all deck building games. However, the unique aspect of Aeon Zen is how they go into your discard pile. So once you buy something, it will then go in. So the order that you purchase things and the order that you discard things, because I think you play during your turn, gets discarded in whatever order you want, is key. Also, when you cast spells, if you have an open breach, you have the choice to cast a spell. If it's a closed breach that you focus and then prepared, well, you have to cast it right away. So keep that in mind because the way cards go in and out of your deck is very intriguing. Uh, you will have to resist the minions of the Nameless. They have special powers that will slowly tick down that you can sometimes stop by spending Aether. You have to buy gems, which we have at the top here, to gain Aether. We also have some different relics that will do things like give you charges to use your special ability, focus players' breaches. And then we've got the spells, which you're gonna be using in order to defeat the Nameless as well as their minions. And don't let those minions hang around too long because their persistent effects and things they can do every turn can be really nasty and keeping that board managing not too many cards out is how you don't take a lot of damage. Now you will lose the game if Gravehold ever ends up at zero life. There's the new fire tokens. If you get 10 fires at your location, you will also lose. And if every single mage is exhausted, then you will lose the game. I think that summarizes everything. Agreed. All right. So on that note, we're now going to grab our drink, grab our best friend, and fellow breach mage. And we're gonna take it to the table one more time. One more time. I'm looking forward to trying Mazra. I'm looking forward to burning stuff down with Talix. Oh, look, I still had them all charged up. As you can see, I really wanted to destroy the Nameless. No cheating though. So Julie, it's been a while. It's also been a while for a legacy game. So we've got two things that she surprisingly really likes. Well, surprisingly I say because of legacy games, she did not expect to like that. So if you saw her first review, well, you know. <laughs> yeah, let's say legacy games. I mean, I don't even have an example. Yeah, I have, you have to mark up the cards. So you gotta put stickers on them <laughs> and then you have to take a pen to the card. Like that just, it's like somebody saying to fold the pages of a book. It just seems 
absolutely wrong, but you get used to it, and uh, you know it's just part of it, part of the game now. Yeah. So this is Aeon's End Legacy of Gravehold. If you happen to skip over the intro, you're right at the review. We just said the name again, Julie. What did you think of this game? We're back in the world of our first ever Legacy game because Aeon's End Legacy was our first one. I really enjoy this game. Um, I like the fact that it's different in the sense of, uh, that, you know, as you're discarding your cards, you know, you don't shuffle them, you just turn your, so the way you play just your Just turn your deck over. And pull from there. So the way you play your cards does have an impact and, and how there's, there's really, there's no dice rolling in this, in this game. Um, you know, you're opening breaches. Yeah. Just so you know, the dice and some of these other tokens that you may see, are from uh, the accessory pack. So just a nice little upgrade that makes things a little easier to track rather than using all the tokens. So uh, what about this particular game? So uh, I've played the, we've paid five. Four, four missions. So we are at the, the halfway point. Now, minor spoilers. If you would like to not have any spoilers, skip ahead just a few seconds. I've gone ahead in the book. We've chosen the Gravehold narrative instead of the Azur narrative. Now, the next section actually takes us back to the start of the Azur book narrative. It's the same paragraph, but in the Gravehold book. So from what it looks like right now, you will be able to experience both storylines in a single book. Just depends on how you start. Okay. Now, you're good to go. If you just happen to skip ahead and we're waiting for me to talk, no more spoilers if they got to the right spot. <laughs> but in any case, um, they may have just skipped the whole review. Hopefully not. Uh, I played with uh, Kadir uh, for all four um, of the all four of the missions, and I uh, tried different characters for my second character. I kept Kadir because she and Malister uh, work well together, and there are some relationship upgrades that we got, and it seemed to make sense. Uh, I'm starting to get the hang of her to play her properly, uh, she was a little frustrating at first because I don't think I was getting full benefit from her. Um, no, you barely got it, her path ability off uh, at all in the first couple of games. I think even then you've only used it about twice. Yeah, but there's other things that she can do well that, that definitely uh, do lend. And, and, you know, I played Claudia. Now I'm playing Mazra. Seems, uh, she seems very powerful. We didn't really get into the whole, like, I didn't get very far into her powers, but they're uh, um, they're fun. Um, you know, Claudia was fun. Uh, Geiger was okay. Nah. I think you just didn't quite figure out how to use Geiger smoothly. I think also necessarily some of the cards weren't really in his favor. Also the nemesis, you really wanted to start getting stuff going and Geiger really benefits from hanging on to a spell, charging it up and then letting, you know, letting it fly. But that just didn't really work in the scenarios that we were playing. So. Uh, like Julie, I've been playing one character the entire time. I've been playing Malister, and I have to say, I think he might be my favorite character so far. I mean, even looking at the mages that Julie's played, his ability to get inventions, put them in people's hands, and do lots of cool stuff has really let us bring the heat and burn down those uh, those nameless when we needed to. So it's, it was tricky at first. It took me about a game or two to get the hang of him, but once I started just primarily getting a few spells, getting some stuff going with him and then really getting his inventions into play and into the hands of the other players made a big difference. Uh, and then I also played Lost, who is very straightforward and a lot of fun. I think if you just want a Breach Mage, it's just going to be blasting everything in a straightforward manner. He's a good one. Uh, now I'm playing Talix, who I have to say is a very interesting character because he's all about sparks. Uh, getting charges and then just doing massive amounts of damage to the nemesis. So as you can tell you, I did almost 34 damage in two rounds just because of the way Talix works. So he's that character where you're not going to be doing necessarily the most interesting thing, but if you can keep him around, he'll get you out of some really tough spots. And he's been a key mage against the last two uh, nameless. So, I mean, uh, it's it's been an interesting story. I've enjoyed the story. Uh, you know, some of the and some of the nameless have, or I should say, some of the missions have been more fun than others. Uh, but it's it's overall been a lot of fun, and I I've realized why it's you know it's a staple in our collection. I really enjoy it. It's a shame that it's been over a year since it's been on the table. 
Yeah, we've been doing a lot of different content. We also got a lot of campaign games that kind of arrived all at once. This is also a campaign game. So we're trying to clear our backlog and that also just kept us from even getting some of the expansions that we have for Outcast and even New Age to the table, unfortunately. So, I, I mean, I definitely enjoyed this. I like the legacy aspect of it on, and how some cards can t come back. You know, you've had them in one mission and then they come back the next mission and you've already started to boost them up. So that's, you know, that's definitely that's, interesting. That's a new mechanic. So why don't we talk about that? Because the boosting aspect is something that, uh, not a spoiler, but it's something that we haven't seen in any of the other Aeon's Endgames. Uh, basically, uh, if I use the exp like this spell, the Rainbow Surge, uh, you know, if if um, if you de destroy a minion using this card, then you get to boost it to mark it up, and then the next time you play it, you gain a life for each boost you have on it. So it's a, like a secondary benefit. Uh, you know, that you, there are different upgrades as well. This spark card, basically, when there's a five card, a five spell beside it, five or more cost spell, uh, you can boost it, and then when it once it's fully boosted, it gains a charge. So you know, definitely some added benefit, uh, and and it makes it you makes you have makes you try to make sure you're planning things out properly. Mm -hmm. No, I really like that aspect of the game. There's also the overheat element that we've only seen on one card that we've used so far, which will eventually thin the deck out as those cards are destroyed and then removed from the game. So that's one thing that you have in Legacy. You will be destroying cards if you don't do well managing your fires. So keep that in mind, which is also a new mechanic that I'll discuss. You will not get as many cards that the booklet will tell you to destroy cards as you open up new packs. So you do have a map, and uh, for those of you that are wondering why we haven't showcased the components, well, I did link it earlier if you happen to skip ahead. Uh, so here is the map, and you can see we've got some overall upgrades. The map, we had the fire tokens on it that just dropped off, but you can see the markers. If you happen to get 10 fire tokens or more on your location on the map, you will actually lose the scenario. So that's a new mechanic. So far, it hasn't been overly challenging for us, but this last mission, we were taking a lot of fire damage and if it hadn't been for the fact that we had a few mitigating uh, options, we might have lost to the fire. So keep that in mind. Overall, I really do like it. I have to say though, that with regards to building the legacy mages, I'm not so sure that I like upgrading existing characters as much as I like building my own. Okay. In the original legacy game. Yeah. Uh, I mean, I I haven't found that uh, necessarily that the upgrades uh, to the mages have been that great. I think that they're upgrade we're upgrading cards uh, and boosting cards more than uh, upgrading the mages per se. Yeah. Right now, the only thing we really did was made the link between uh, Kadir and Malister. And one of the big reasons for that is Malister's ability, and minor spoiler, makes it so all of his inventions affect Kadir as well. No more spoiler. <laughs> so it's really cool. And it's one of the things that work well together. The other relationship upgrades, we haven't been as keen on because we just found better card upgrades. Like we rather have that spark that gives a charge, which right now is with Kadir, but maybe it'll come back to, to Malice or later on. Like we're just passing cards around, trying to get them boosted, trying to get everything activated to make our mages as strong as possible. And that's been a lot of fun. It's gonna be interesting to see where we go as we go back to the, the start. Uh, also, if you do want to see the components, I mentioned it quickly that I'd linked it earlier. I will be coming up at the end of the video. We're going to link you to our Aeon's End uh, Legacy of Gravehold unboxing. So you can check that out if you like to see what everything looks like. Because it's a Legacy game, we're not showcasing the components. I just wanted to reiterate that. And if you get me, if I get confused, oh, sorry, if I confuse you when I say Nameless or Nemesis, it's because the Nameless cards are called the Nemesis deck. I don't have anything else to add. I'd be ready to wait to rate it. Yeah, the one thing I want to mention that we didn't actually talk about is the new, the last thing is the new Aether Tokens, which you can see here, uh, sort of. So what this lets you do is you will gain tokens that you can use later on. You get to save them and then use them to either deal with some of the larger nameless abilities that you need to discard uh, using the a certain amount of Aether, you can use them to buy more spells. And we've got the gem here, the Aether Dust, which I think is pretty cool, even though it's expensive. It only gives you two, but it gives everyone else an Aether. And when we've been able to play that card, it's really helped out and let us very much handle a lot of the nasty abilities from uh, the minions as well as uh, the Nameless's powers. 
And I really am enjoying the, the legacy aspect. Again, I don't love writing on cards. Just I let Julie do it. She's got much prettier handwriting than, than I do. But the upgrade phase and everything like that, I think, is a lot of fun. Uh, we've been just having... You know, like, we, we really enjoy this game. I'm trying to think of, like, a, a better word instead of saying fun multiple times. I would say the only the negative that I have found in this particular game is the amount of time between games uh, to upgrade, to set up, to, to get the next game going is, is fairly long. It's I think the other day it took us over 35 minutes to get set up for the next game. And I think that's where upgrading mages that are already built versus making your own mage is a little bit of a detriment to the game because you're trying to figure out which mages you want to play, which mages you're going to upgrade. Whereas in Legacy, you picked your mage, you figured out you know what path you're going to be going on, and then you're upgrading down that path steadily the way you want to build your character, which I always thought was pretty cool. It just made it a little easier to yeah. go forward and keep pushing through the story. Whereas at this point, we're like, oh, we got to do this, got to do that. Oh, we're going to upgrade this breach. We should get this breach. So there's a lot more discussion and debate, which is good. It makes the game a lot more interactive and cooperative. But at the same point in time, it does really give you a lot of downtime, which is the big negative. Also, I'd have to say that the nameless so far in this have been challenging. I do feel like they've kind of scaled back the difficulty just a teeny bit, maybe only because there was two really nasty uh, nameless in the previous boxes that we've played, uh, Fenrix and uh, New Age, and then there was the opening one in Outcast, that uh, the one that had those uh, those little like thorns, yeah. the extra minions that drove us nuts. Don't ask me, I don't remember these things, kinds of things. Yeah, but uh, that, that uh, nameless was very challenging. So they feel like they've toned it down just a little bit. That being said, you're still being pushed. And what I mean, like the difference between like Aeons and having a very difficult game and just toning down a bit can really mean that you always feel like you have a chance to win. I know that Fenrix is probably one of the most frustrating nameless that there is. Lots of people have really complained about playing, especially at four players. And as you can see right now, we're playing it at four players. We've got the play match, we've got everything. So production value, quality, everything is exactly where it needs to be. If you're a fan of legacy games, if you're a fan of Aeons and this is definitely a must for the collection. And the storyline is continuing. You're already getting into your rating. What? That's stuff that we normally give in our rating. It doesn't matter. I'm talking about it now. It's not necessarily my rating. Saying this is a must to add to your collection. Well then, give your rating then, since you've already given your thoughts on. <laughs> All right. So my rating for Aeon's End Legacy of Gravehold. I gotta say, this was almost a nine. Almost a nine. It gets the eight point five. The downtime just. Just hurts it for me with where we're currently at with the little guy spending half an hour to 40 minutes sometimes. And because that we may be taking too long, but even then, if it was 20 minutes to upgrade between games, it's just something we don't really have as much as we used to do it. It just puts us like, you know, going to bed a little later or potentially we're like getting set up for the next game and he's napping and then he's like, oh, and we're like, oh man, we haven't even started. <laughs> So I give it an eight and a half as well. Uh, I, I definitely uh, did enjoy it. There's some things like Jason said that uh, now that I'm remembering about the previous legacy game that I preferred, but this is uh, this is a very st solid game. I really enjoy it. And I think, uh, as Jason said, uh, if you like legacy games, if you like uh, the idea of mages and fantasy world, I think, uh, I think you'll enjoy this. Uh, it's a lot of fun. Um, so I would recommend it. It also feels in this game, just storyline wise, that we may be getting to the end of Aeon's End with uh, the new Astro Knights that just kickstarted and uh, like a whole new, new updated version. I would like them to end the storyline, not because I don't want more Aeon's End, but because it'd be nice to maybe get some more standalone content using this system. So on that note, it's time to remind you to like, comment, subscribe, and hit the bell to be notified when we have some new content for you. And take a look down below in the video description, you'll find links to all of our social media feeds, Facebook, Twitter, Instagram. So if you'd like to see pictures of Julie and I playing Legacy of Gravehold, they'll be playing on those feeds. Also, you should make sure to hit that subscribe button that Julie mentioned, because we will be doing a full campaign review that will have full spoilers, 
once we get this completed. I'll switch there's a link down there to multizone.ca, a great Canadian game store. Click that link, you'll get 10% off your next purchase. It's a great way to support the channel as a portion of that purchase is returned to us. So if you're looking for a legacy of Gravel, they may be able to get you a copy. And now popping up in front of us are gonna be links to some of our previously released videos. In front of me will be our most recent release. In front of Julie will be our unboxing of Aeons and Legacy of Gravel. So you can get an idea as to what is all in this big box and possibly not sure yet you may see a card popping up that will take you back well take you to our full campaign review on that note we now need to grab our drinks grab our best friend and fellow mage remind everyone to keep playing games